Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of a request. And today's first story is the install job or fine, I'll leave the premises. The following is based on a true story. The author claims no responsibility for any slight embellishment of the events described herein for dramatic effect. Let us assign the variables. Iris equals you slash Iris Gal, Holy Empress of the Server Room, Duchess of Active Directory, Slayer of Rogue DHCP Servers. Not actually named Iris, her true name is a few letters off from a masculine name of the same root. This is important. Karen equals the Fool. Underling equals an earnest young squire. Site Manager equals a foreign duke. VP equals foreign prince. Ops Manager equals a lumpy blockhead bureaucrat from the north. Fridge Co. equals a developing third world country. Conveyor Co. equals primary export, motor-driven roller. 1. Wherein Karen discovers a lazy worker. A soft early spring rain patters on the umbrella. Underneath its protective nylon blend, Iris takes a drag on her American spirit cigarette. The menthol cools her throat, the nicotine invigorates her. Today is a big day. She has made a long journey out from her office in the city of country music, tourists in cowboy hats, an exceptionally spicy fried chicken, to a Fridge Co. distribution plant in one of its suburbs. Her company is nearing the completion of a conveyor system, and her part in all of it is to install the software she wrote to allow it to interact with the customer system. It is a dark morning, and the rain shows no sign of stopping today. The clock on her silently glowing smartphone screen reads Saturday, February 15th, 7.45 a.m. She frowns, slips it into the pocket of her jeans, and shivers irritably from the morning chill, against which her company-branded polyester blend jacket does little to protect her. Her new underling is late. The cigarette goes out in a fizzle, as Iris presses it into some collected rainwater at the top of a trash bin, then walks inside introduces herself to the clerk and asks to be taken to the server room, where she will spend most of her day preparing the application server with all the software it needs before spending a few hours performing on-site unit testing. It's nice and warm inside, especially near the server rack, so she pulls a cart over to it and sets her laptop on it and takes off her jacket to reveal a black conveyor coat tee. In a few minutes, she's connected to the server via remote desktop. The .NET framework installs quickly, so she has little to do, but wait while SQL Server and RS Logics are downloaded. Thus enter, preceded by the aromas of espresso, perfume, and stress, Karen, whom Iris will later learn as the personnel supervisor, a woman in her late 30s, with makeup caked on in a clear and futile desperation to stay young and attractive, and an expression as if she had just smelled something slightly unpleasant. It is apparently her resting face, as upon seeing Iris, that expression contorts even further in outrage. What are you doing in here? She demands. You're supposed to be out on the floor with the others, installing our system. That's what I'm doing, explains Iris, placatingly, as she extends a hand. I'm Iris, senior software developer at Conveyor Co., and I'm here to install the control software. No, you're not. Karen's interjection slices Iris's explanation like a Japanese sushi knife through a sheet of paper. You're a lazy worker, and you thought you could slack off in the server room and no one would know. I know who the programmer is, and he's a man. Women aren't smart enough for that kind of work anyway. You're a technician, which means you do what the men in engineering say. It's at this point that Iris decides Karen's behavior warrants retaliation. But when she opens her mouth, struggling to bite back both a scathing sarcastic retort and instead choosing to ask Karen to let her talk to site manager to sort the whole thing out, Karen strikes again. On top of that, you don't have a vest or a hard hat. If you were working for us, you'd be fired on the spot. I want you off the site now. Two. Despicable me, except the minion gets to be Gru for a day. As Karen yells that last word, Underling chooses that precise moment to appear. Tall, a bit lanky, bespectacled, but smartly groomed, and dressed in a conveyor co polo and slacks. Visibly confused and alarmed, Karen flashes a smile at him. Finally, you look like the man in charge. I'm assuming your masculine pronunciation of Iris's true name. Your employee was just sitting around in here slacking off, and I'm in the process of having her removed from the site. She says this with deep satisfaction, as if expecting Iris's boss to reprimand her. Actually, I... begins Underling. Well? Karen asks expectantly. Silence reigns for all of ten long, awkward seconds. Underling is technically just supposed to check in with Iris before heading out to the floor to assist the engineers in testing the PLC, and later, her own software. He stands there scratching sheepishly at the back of his head, eyes pleading for help from his boss. Iris looks at Karen, 
who has smugly crossed her arms. Back at Underling, then back to Karen. Screw it. You know what time it is. I know what time it is. Karen just activated Iris's malicious compliance card. She gives Underling a nod and mouths play along. Uh, that is very bad of you. I, uh, wanna go home, Underling Ventures? Fine, I'm out of here. Iris moves to shut her laptop down. Karen screeches. What do you think you're doing? Don't touch that. That's company property. It's my property, Iris replies testily. She paid $1,300 for it. Being both a programmer and the lead IT at a small company has its perks, like being able to hook up your own personal work laptop to the Active Directory instead of using one of the cheapo brands her pitiful, despite hard-fought budget affords for the other employees. No, it is not, you liar. You're lucky I don't call the police on you. Now leave the premises now. Okay, no big deal. Underling can take it back to the office instead. Karen continues, voice barely below a shout, about how tomorrow morning, I will be in a very important meeting with your bosses, and I'm going to tell them everything, and I'm going to watch them fire you. And so on and so forth. Iris has stopped listening as that voice follows her back out to her car, accompanied by Underling's unsure and absurdly hilarious, and uh, don't come back? Iris is not phased. Sure, she has some choice words for the woman, most of which start with B or C and end with itch or unt, respectively, but she knows exactly what is going to happen tomorrow. The thought gives her no small amount of vicious, petty glee. It's a plan which would not have worked were the following not true. A. Karen has only ever been included in group emails with her, never conference calls. B. Karen holds certain opinions about the differences between men and women and what sort of jobs they belong in. C. When instructed to leave the premises, it generally means that you are banned from the work site, not just ejected. D. Karen is, well, Karen. Iris sends Underling a text and starts the engine. The sound of Tatsuro Yamashita's crooning voice fills her car as she drives home to spend the rest of her weekend playing Civilization V and Final Fantasy XIV. 3. The brown matter collides with the rotary ventilation device. Iris arrives for work late, as usual. Yesterday's rains have ushered in weather slightly warmer than absolute zero, and the wind chill cuts through her Anne Klein Executive Collection two-piece suit, jacket, and pencil skirt with relentless ease. Inside the familiar scent of cheap office coffee, printer paper and freshly sawed metal greets her. Underling has, as instructed, dutifully returned her laptop and its bag to her desk. He also, according to a post-it note, installed the software packages Iris had left downloading, then updated Ops Manager on the situation. Good Underling. Iris will have to reward him with donuts later. Cables connected, it boots up, and Gmail helpfully reminds her she's been invited to a meeting in the conference room in three minutes. Excellent. She decides to wait outside the conference room for about eight minutes and let Karen dig herself into a hole, with site manager in attendance, all according to Keikaku. Translator's note, Keikaku means plan. Not according to Keikaku is the presence of Fridgeco's VP of something or other. It doesn't matter though, VP is pretty chill. Outside the conference room, Iris can hear site manager demanding to know why the interface software hasn't been installed why they'll have to wait until next week, outside production hours for another install window. The entire project has been pushed back a week. The deadline won't be met. Oh, the humanity! Ops manager, Iris's boss, advises him there's still three weekends left until the deadline, and once everything's sorted out, the system will be up and running well before then. And just as Karen is launching into a tirade about how she removed one of the techs from the site for not having her equipment and trying to slack off in an unauthorized area, Iris strides confidently into the room. Ops manager, a big late boomer with gray hair, a square face, and a square body, looks up at her with consternation and relief. Hey, Iris, you're late, he says amicably in his Thousand Lakes accent. Site manager, Karen, VP, this is Iris, our senior IT and software developer. Some of you have spoken with her over the phone or via email. Iris, can you explain to us about why the install hasn't been completed? Iris quietly looks at Karen and smiles. Karen, poleaxed, has taken on the shade of milk two weeks past its expiration date. Site manager just looks impatient. VP adds expectantly, So, did you have any trouble with our systems? Were there any bugs? Ah, the sweet feeling of anticipation before moving in for the kill. Actually, none of those things. Karen, maybe you would like to explain why the senior software developer left your facility at 8.27 a.m. Shock and surprise can be heard all around the room. Karen stammers. Karen stutters. Iris half expected to need to call Underling in to corroborate with her against lies from Karen, but Karen has been knocked off kilter. 
Iris would like to think she was shocked out of her wits to see some lazy worker in baggy jeans and a t-shirt, reintroduced as a smart dressed, though it's really just office dress code VIP, she'd mistaken to be a man. But it was probably just the fact that she'd been caught in a great big fib about how she'd had to remove a lazy, ill-equipped worker from the premises at around half past eight. Her attempts to darvo are so pathetic, Iris almost feels pity. Almost. The rest of the meeting is a regular episode of the breaking of the Karen and a plan to get back on track with the install. Ops manager, although technically impaired, is a shrewd manager and after the meeting, pulls Iris aside to warn her of the dangers of letting a project overrun just for a spot of revenge, but presses the issue no further. Iris, despite her hopes to the contrary, does see Karen again at Fridgeco next weekend and several times during startup and production support. But the barely attractive woman never communicates to her save with a silent sour glare. Site manager gets what he wanted, the project done on time. Conveyor Co. gets paid. Iris gets nothing but her salary as usual. A little over a year later, during a routine system checkup call with the site maintenance lead, Karen's name is brought up and Iris asks about her. Rumor has it her pay was docked slightly and she was written up and about seven months later she took a sideways promotion to corporate middle management. Iris thinks the maintenance lead, wraps up her monthly report and starts writing this story. The second story is… She didn't want to hear about her car being towed. I don't know if this is the most appropriate sub for this story, so let me know if it belongs somewhere else. I work security for a private business campus that has venues that are often rented by outside groups. One particularly large hall was rented by a local church group and we sold their tickets at the box office immediately in front of the venue. Without going into boring detail, there was only one way into the hall for the general public, but numerous exits with cameras everywhere. Parking is free in all three of our parking decks, except in clearly marked reserved spaces, which will be important soon. While visitors were still arriving for the event, our dispatch center received a call from our largest campus tenant, complaining that a car was parked in one of their 24-7 reserve spaces, and they need it moved ASAP. This company pays for these spaces and is constantly using them at all hours of the day and on weekends, which is why we have numerous highly visible signage for this row of spaces, warning people of this fact and that towing is enforced. We reviewed camera footage and saw that the owner was a woman dressed in fine Sunday clothes that were an almost painful shade of lime green with a matching hat. This would have been enough to identify her even in our large hall, but we then noticed that she bypassed the ticket line and made her way to one of the venue exit doors. She stayed there several minutes and when one of the cleaning staff exited, she slipped in behind them. We're still not sure how she knew she could do this by the way. As the supervisor on duty, I entered the hall and found her in one of the front rows sitting in a group of people. She saw me coming in my security uniform and immediately scrunched up her face. Me, ma'am, can I? Her, interrupting me. Now, I just sat down. What is it you want? She was already on the defensive and loud. Not a sign of innocence in my experience. Me, I'm with campus security and I need to ask. Her, cutting me off. What you need to do is leave me alone. I'm sitting with my family and we're here to enjoy my nephew's concert. Ain't nothing so important you rent-a-cops need to be bothering me like this. Me. Actually, it is important. If you wouldn't mind coming with me, we can talk in the aisle and… Note, she thinks I'm here because she didn't buy a ticket, but I don't care about that. I'm trying to tell her about her car before we have to tow it. This is her only chance to move it herself. Her. No, you ain't kicking me out of here at my own nephew's church concert. Now she starts avoiding eye contact with me. Me. Ma'am, I'm not here about how you got inside this hall. I'm… Her. Raising her voice even more. I don't know what you're talking about, but you need to leave me the heck alone. At this point it was so comical that I remember getting the biggest smile on my face and telling her, that's all I needed to hear, enjoy your show. I left and had her car towed immediately. Two hours later she reported her car stolen to our security desk. The desk officer informed her that she parked in a reserve spot and that security had tried to make contact with her before the show began, according to our log. She loudly demanded to speak to whoever was in charge and that's when I came around the corner and introduced myself. The look on her face was priceless and she didn't say another word as I gave her the information for the tow company's lot, which was closed by that time. Thank you for subscribing and so many likes. Have a good day!